All right. So this is a uh, sort of my confession that we had been doing it wrong and uh, doing security wrong in in web standards. Uh, and I just got to ask, why is that? Why were we doing it wrong? Um, so capability security, you know, um, uh, I was is 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 a is a I think the far superior technology, but it's it's not the one that the world has adopted at this point. And so, you know, this is me saying, given the worst is better tendency in software deployment, are we ever going to get there? Um, and uh, let's see, introducing Sorry, my map cut out there. All right. Introducing capabilities to the next generation. Uh, there's a couple talks on this that I've given. Um, I'll use the other, a different one. Not that one. I think it's this one. Yes. So this is spring 2018. It was an R-Chain developer conference in Boulder. Pretty cool. Back before the wheels came off. OK, so the short version, we're going to talk about the growth of the web, object capability, discipline, and formal verification. So there's a colleague, Tim Berners-Lee, said, what was once a rich selection of blogs and websites has been compressed under the powerful weight of a few dominant platforms. The fact is that the power is concentrated among so few companies that it has made it possible to weaponize the web at scale. That was an article Tim had written a few months earlier, the web is under threat. Um, okay, so as we mentioned, we used to do this um, standard stuff back in 91. There's a draft of the web, the HTML spec that Tim and I wrote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a great tweet. Uh, Jim Hendler, a colleague, says, if you win the Turing Prize, MIT finds you an appropriate job. <laughs> anyway, Tim was a really humble guy. If the room needs cleaning, he cleans it. Um, all right, so Mr. HTTP, in a way, the guy, Fielding is the guy who did REST. Uh, he was a colleague back then, too. When REST was being framed, it seemed inconceivable that 2 billion people would all agree to use one, one website, Facebook. Um, and then here's Greg. Um, there's this guy, Blue Beetle. I've never met him or whatever, but he said, if you're not paying for it, you're, the, you're not the customer, you're the product. You heard of that one? But um, the way Greg puts it is, there's a stranglehold on social media today. People don't get a chance to participate in the economic proposition in an equitable way. So this is a talk I got to see in Kansas City. Um, Kate Shartlett worked on cyber policy in the US Department of Defense for the last decade, both I think Republican and Democratic uh, uh, organizations, uh, administrations. Nation states have successfully used this vulnerability to destabilize our democracy. The Russians are at it currently these days. Um, so this is serious business. All right, so uh, something I found on, I don't know where, Terrence Eden, 2012, compare Twitter to email. If Twitter goes down, that's it, game over, no more Twitter. If Google decided to shut down Gmail, it'd be a blow, but email would continue working. We need to continue to use protocols, not services. The reason email, HTTP, FTP can't be switched off is that anyone can use them for any purpose. They're not at the whim of any owner. So there's a difference between protocols and services. So protocols and smart contracts are sort of the same thing. You might imagine a smart contract called email. All right, so then there's the economics of email, spam and phishing and stuff. So the economics of email, the original decentralized internet communication platform is what led me to trade my privacy to Google for spam protection. Um, 
you know, the thought when I was in the nineties, the thought of letting Google, you know, some, some other, some big company host my email so they could read it and send me ads and stuff. Are you kidding? But spam got to the point where I said, well, okay, thrown in the towel. Okay, so the secure, the state of the art in secure software. I think the top line is from Mark Miller. Uh, computers are getting faster, smaller, more connected and more capability. But when it comes to secure, security, and then the rest of, the, rest of this is from Quinn Norton, a security practitioner. She's got this great essay called Everything is Broken. The number of people whose job it is to make software secure can practically fit in a large bar and I've watched them drink. It's not comforting. It's not a matter of if you get owned, it's only a matter of when. That's her take on it. Um, I'm not quite that pessimistic, but it, it's, it is bad out there. So in 2010, I, I moved from, the, from um, the web consortium to University of Kansas Medical Center where I was in charge of um, medical records uh, of 500,000 people. So <clears throat> I once found an article that estimated the cost of a breach at $15 per health record. So if somebody hacked into this database that I was in charge of 500,000 records times $15, I don't even wanna write that number down. So that was my job. Okay, what, go ahead. That's a lot of money to be in charge of. <laughs> right, I mean, I had, it was a team and all this kind of stuff, but uh, you know, the, the software de design decisions I was making, you know, if I did them wrong, if we did the wrong. Okay, so what tools or what, what weapons did I have to play defense? So I had Unix file permissions. I don't know if you've ever messed with Unix file permissions, Shafi? Not me, no. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So you get to say um, whether the owner or the group or the world gets read or write or execute permissions. Anyway, you get to say whether, you know, certain people, um, mm -hmm get reader access or whatever. So here's a puzzle that I, I ran into occasionally. How, I, how do I give access to folder one to you without giving access to anyone else and without root access so I can't create a new group? I'm pretty sure this puzzle is not solvable. Um, so then there's database grants. The medical informatics, we had a whole bunch of database. In database grants, you get to say, grant insert on table one to Bob, grant select any table to Fred, and then you try to solve these puzzles of who should get access to what, and you eventually go, screw it, and you grant DBA, which is like access to every, do everything to everything. You just grant DBA to Dan and you get your job done. <laughs> of course, this makes it more likely that somebody's going to get at those 500,000 medical records, right? And not only that, how do we connect database record, database permissions to Unix file permissions so that you could say, everybody in this Unix file group, can I get access to this table? Well, can't be done. Okay, so maybe Java was going to solve all the problems. We were going to have Java applets and stuff in the 90s. Well, no, the Java class loader is a long string of security vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, and just if you're an enterprise, just one of the things you have to do is upgrade all your job. It's a fire drill every once in a while. There, there's a, somebody finds a, a security bug in Java and you have to upgrade Java everywhere, every, you know, because it's just a complete, you know, emergency nightmare. So if, if our, some of the uh, Java virtual machine uh, vulnerabilities would have meant, meant so that anybody on the street could have access to all those 500,000 records. It was just, you know, it's a nightmare. Okay, and then here's the web security stuff, which was kind of where we started. The web has a similar thing called the same origin policy. Um, and the developers are all like Stack Overflow articles on ways to circumvent the same origin policy. And why do I have to use an HTTP server and stuff? So a, everybody hates it, and so they find ways to work around it, and it just doesn't work very well. Okay, so here are the two ways of doing it, the wrong way and the right way. The wrong way is on, the, well, the way with the, the dominant way, you know, the way that the software industry chose in the 70s that is getting us to all these problems is on the left. So um, the files have a list called an access control list that says, who gets to have what kinds of permissions. So the arrows go so sort of from the files to the parties that might wanna do the accessing. 
Okay, so capability security, you flip it around. You say, um, Alice has a capability to read this file and write that file. Bob has a capability to read th these two files. Carol has capabilities. Da, da, da. So it's like, what's, well, what the heck? What's the difference? Okay. Mm. It looks pretty symmetric. All right. Um, so, and this is kind of an aside. This is a talk by this guy gave at the Linux Security Summit in 2015. If you if you get a chance to like Google it up and find his talk and stuff, it's really great. But okay, so it, it's called Giant Bags of Most, Mostly Water, Securing Your IT Infrastructure by Securing Your Team. And he harks back to the way cars were sold in the in the 1950s. Um, 238 horsepower, you know, turbo glide on my air conditioning, roomy seat, smooth and raw power and comfort. And the Journal of American Medical Association in 1955 said, vehicle interiors are so poorly constructed from a safety standpoint that it's surprising that anyone escapes from an automobile accident without serious injury. Pretty poor review. <laughs> company, car company responses, protecting drivers against crashes is expensive, adding safety features, sacrifices style and comfort problems, much better solved by driver education. Customers are just not asking for it. Sounds familiar? We still design IT infrastructure like we designed cars in the 1960s. Raw power and company, more, or it's more RAM, more cores, larger, faster disk, faster, lower latency networks, one click deployment. Mm -hmm. IT company responses protecting users against their own mistakes is expensive. Adding safety features sacrifices usability. Problems are much better solved by user education. Customers are just not asking for it. Uh, as an industry, we don't care about security. We gladly ship products with known security failings and no plans to update them. This is a damning, as damning a quote as the one from the American Medical Association. So this is sort of like the gal who said, you know, I've seen all the people in a bar. It's not pretty. Mm. Um, then there was this Ralph Nader who came up with this book, Unsafe at Any Speed. He blamed car manufacturers for designed in danger, da, 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 and it got better. Oh, interesting. So, um, a new hope. My two hopes are correct by construction software and object capability discipline. So, um, I'll take a quick time out. Uh, I just ran across this the other day, or yesterday, in fact. Big warnings. Warning, evaluating JavaScript from a string is an enormous security risk. It's far too easy for a bad actor to run arbitrary code with user val. See, never use it. Ah! <laughs> They're wrong. Arbitrary code execution isn't the problem. The problem is ambient authority and separation of designation from authority. What the heck am I talking about? All right. So um, these are some slides from a Mark, talk by Mark Miller. Um, so security is extreme modularity. Now this is talking to software engineers who you're not one of them. So um, um, there's also, there's parallels to sort of social structures too, but um, I didn't have those on these slides. Um, but in software in general, you sort of avoid needless dependencies. It would be bad if, your uh, if your bank software depended on the version of your uh, latest video game, right? Mm, got you. So uh, in the same way, it's bad if a bug in your bank software and your a bug in your video game can uh, make your bank software vulnerable. Yeah. Turns out that technically these are roughly the same problem. Vulnerability is a point of dependency. Uh, okay, ob object capability systems, the, the, they don't dominate the industry, but they do exist. Uh, so yeah, I remember Dean talking about this and he was saying, he gave the example of um, uh, where you're going to a valet instead of giving um, the valet access to your entire car, they can do whatever they want. You just give them access to the valet key. And that's, that's as far as I understand, kind of the agoric 
programming model yep. where you, you can give people the valet key instead of giving them access to the entire car type thing? Uh, it's the way you give them access to the car also. Um, so there's this, Mark Stigler is, has this great picture book of secure cooperation. And after explaining all this kind of stuff, this is his punchline slide. The patterns described in this picture book are simple because they discard the modern fascination with the identities of the participants. Mm -hmm. So when you go and look at the programming documentation for almost all these systems, it says, okay, here's how you figure out the identity and then you check whether that person's allowed to do something. In capability okay. security, you never ask who's calling. Uh, okay. Your car doesn't say, who are you when you get in the car? Your car just, if you have the yeah. key, you're off and running, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Suppose your car, yeah. instead of accepting a delegatable key, demanded that your driver's license match the car's title registry, which happens to be in your spouse's name. Entrepreneurs would leap forward to develop ever more powerful identity management for automobiles. We would subcontract to security yeah. experts so that our teenage daughters could borrow the car to buy milk. Heaven forfend that the daughter, breaking her leg, had to delegate to her best friend to get to the hospital. <laughs> then you'll get people faking their, their driving license. Exactly. And, and this is how we run software today. Hey, can you just give me your password for a sec? I got it going. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. These patterns focus on authorization. Ask not who are you, but rather are you allowed? This was always the crucial question. Any, anyway, by asking a better question, we get a better answer. So there's, you know, there's ways to do this in software and stuff. Um, oh, that was me. That, that was the 2008 thing that I, we were looking at a second ago. Uh, so there's some details of this and, and you actually can using that software technique, you can, you can actually make um, tokens, you know, cryptocurrency tokens in 30, you know, 30, 40 lines of code, which is kind of interesting. That was designed in 2000 and part of the, the um, it says before present, presenting this uh, following simple example of simple capability based money, we must attempt to head off any confusion this, this example repeatedly causes. We are not proposing to actually do money this way. A desirable system is this back in 2000. Well, <laughs> now we're actually proposing to do money this way. <laughs> Our chain and Agoric both. So this was the actual code. Um, yeah, and there are systems where uh, somebody's collecting identity information for creditworthiness or something like that. Mm. Um, and this is a reasonable business proposition, but they should pay you for it, <laughs> you know? Mm. Uh, one of the, you know, the, the trade-off these days is you get, you know, 5% off at the, at the grocery store for using their loyalty card or something like that, which is, you know, maybe a fair deal. But every time you're giving away identity information, somebody ought to be paying you for it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Anyway, and then there's the correct by construction software. And that's kind of a whole spin your propeller really fast. Uh, oh yeah, this Aaron Schwartz, uh, free culture. I don't know, I can't remember how I wove this in. It was kind of awkward, but oh, this is a really great talk by Lawrence Lessig. Um, creativity and innovation always builds on the past. The past always tries to control creativity that builds on it. Free societies enable the future by limiting the power of the past. Ours is less and less, less and less a free society. Mm. That was one of the things that Aaron Schwartz was fighting against. Oh yeah, what he was into internet stuff, and then he started finding out about all the problems with copyright, and then he started finding out all the problems with Congress. <laughs> You can't get the Congress, the U.S. You know the U.S. government. Yeah. You can't fix the copyright problem because Congress is so weird. The, they they spend all their money trying to um, spend all their time trying to get money. Um, so you know we we live in the land of one dollar one vote. So that's why the at the end of the day that's kind of why the U.S. government squashed him because he was trying to talk sense into people, speak truth to power. Oh, sad. Anyway, our chain had a bunch of the right pieces. It's a tough beast to take on, isn't it? 
especially just being a single person. <laughs> yeah, and it's not so much, well, it's partly the US government, but it's also partly the people that are, you know, in the positions of power. You know, they want to keep it that way. Mm. The past always tries to control the creativity that builds on it. Mm. Once you've got something to conserve, you become conservative. <laughs> Yeah. And he was a radical. So. Anyway. So why was it back then um, the thinking was you can't have a capability based money, but now I guess with blockchain that that's changed things, has it? Um, well, okay, so here's the things that they were not solving at the time, anonymity. Hey, look, Zcash. Hmm. Um, non reputability uh, reliable receipts. Yeah, blockchain gives you that. Yeah. Uh, accounting controls so that, uh, oh, this is the double spend problem. Yeah. Uh, in a way, this thing does solve the double spend problem if you, anyway. And backing redeemability by assets that are already widely valued. That's the other thing is that Bitcoin somehow cracked. <laughs> got people to think that it was valuable yeah i guess enough of if enough of us believe it then it's true yes yeah that's the way money works modern money So, oh yeah, there's a, the social structures version of it. No cap bill of rights. There's two of these. So um, there's these agoric open systems papers, which is when uh, Mark Miller and Nick Zabo and Eric Dressler and all that kind of folks were were sort of writing down their vision of the world and they're still working on it. Yeah. Um, 19, what was that? 1988. Wow. 88, right. So there's a paragraph in there. Encapsulation of information ensures that one object cannot directly read or tamper with the contents of another. Communication enables objects to exchange information by mutual consent. The encapsulation and communication of, of of access insurance that communication rights are similarly controlled and transferable only by mutual consent. So this is some, this is kind of a technical aspect of some programming language works work this way and some don't. And the, it, the kind of the point is to say, look, we need our, op, our programming language objects to work like social objects. That is, I can't go into your brain and screw around with it, right? Mm -hmm. I can send you messages, I can talk to you, and this may you know, cause you to, to respond in various ways and all this kind of stuff, but I talk, you choose, and then you respond, right? Hmm. And so that's how the objects in JavaScript and, and, and uh, a large class of programming languages work. But in C, it's not that way. In C, I could just go in and poke your brain and change something. <laughs> But that'll be pretty dangerous. And absolutely, C is a very pointy instrument. There's only like no programmers in the world that can write C <laughs> without bugs. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and most of our infrastructure is written in C and C plus plus and all this kind of stuff. So how 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 do we protect against that then? Is that why we spend so much money on cybersecurity? And it sure is. It sure is. Yeah. So. There's two approaches to, uh, well, like I said, there's two things that I hope that give me hope. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so 
SEL4 is an operating system. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. It's a very tiny, tiny one. It doesn't do hardly anything. Um, but it's 20,000 lines of C code with zero bugs and a mathematical proof that there are zero bugs. Wow. Yeah. That sounds secure. Yeah. So they wrote a, a formal system in, a, in, a, in one uh, thing, and then they refined that into a language called Haskell, which is one of these really nice programming languages. And then they sort of manually converted it to C and wrote software that proves that the, well, they wrote lots of stuff that proves that the C code is actually respects the system. But um, this is extremely, extremely careful way of writing C code. It takes like, I don't know, three months to write one line of C code that way wow. or something. You know, it took them about 10 years to write 20,000 lines of code. Yeah, Whereas, it's not, not efficient. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> so now, but the C code goes really fast, okay? Hmm. They're, they're at runtime when it's actually executing, there aren't, there isn't anything going, oh, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? We just, we know ahead of time because, because of the way we constructed it, it's correct by construction. And so you don't have to check at runtime that it's, that it's okay. Uh, interesting. So that's one way to build software. And the other way to run, build software is like JavaScript, where the lang the language is like, is, is kind of like, it, it has these, I can't poke into thing properties, but it's like, Oh, you know, it's kind of loosey goosey and whatever the heck, and and nobody has proved anything about the product. The pro, you know, if I just go, like, if I just go and type in something, um, where's console? There's all kinds of crazy things like one plus eight you know, zero, or whatever, gives you ten. <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> should, you know what? Whereas one plus zero is one. You know, and all kinds of crazy stuff like oh, in JavaScript. Okay. And nobody has proved any of the security properties of, the, of this kind of stuff, but it does have the, of these object, object capability security properties where you can't poke into some place where you're not authorized to. Okay. So, and what, uh, so if we have a combination of these things, things that are correct by construction and things that, um, that use capability security, I think we can get there. So the, another really fundamental property about capability security as opposed to the access control list stuff is these guys who are telling you that eval is, you know, never use it and all that kind of stuff. The problem is that when you design stuff using access control lists, if there's a problem anywhere, if you can get like root access on a Linux machine, then <coughs> you can get access to everything. Mm. Whereas with, if you do um, capability-based security, if you, um, if you compromise one object, you only compromise what that object could have done. And it doesn't okay. instantly just sort of mean that your entire computer is completely blown up. I uh, got you. Yeah, so it's like that valet key. If, if you do manage to get the valet key, all you can right. do is drive five miles an hour. You can't, you can't go cruising down the freeway. Yeah, right, you can't open the trunk and all that kind of stuff. Right, yeah, the, these keys can be limited. In what they can do. So if, oops, you know, I gave the wrong, I gave that, gave that key to the wrong guy. Well, it's limited. And you can have keys that, for example, only last 10 hours or, you know, keys that are revocable and all kinds of, in software, you, you can build keys that would be hard to do in hardware. Okay, got you. And, and that's what Agoric brings, right? Yeah. Because the other chains, they don't use like Ethereum, it doesn't use OCAPs, does it? That's right. Yeah, okay. That was... Uh, and Archain. Yeah. And Archain. Uh, so Archain, is that a new chain that you're, you're building, Jim? Uh, yeah, it's, you know, um, I haven't done a whole lot of development. I mean, I've collaborated with Dan on some stuff and uh, I'm working on governance for our oh, chain. Cool. Um, I won a uh, uh, Ideathon award of 100,000 Archain Rev 
to uh, build sure, good no. governance. And um, unfortunately, I ha haven't been able to get good apprentices to work on it. Dan got kind of burned out working on stuff. <laughs> it's time for somebody else to do it. <laughs> but he's still sort of like the uh, ringleader. Uh, my background is in group systems and collective intelligence. Um, 20, 25 years of research at New Jersey Institute of Technology, doing controlled experiments and operational trials of group systems when the head of the computer science department said nobody would ever waste the power of a computer doing electronic mail back in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> um, But we were like, yeah, but many computers make it affordable. <laughs> that is a great quote. Is that published anywhere? It must be. I don't know. I think uh, my boss, Murray Turoff, uh, didn't want to say anything bad about uh, George Moshos, but uh, basically I was there. So. All bets are off. <laughs> yeah, so my work at the Web Consortium, um, there's a, uh, I wonder if it, how do you find the process document? Uh, but uh, basically the bounty system that Dan built is, largely the first prototype of the governance system that we're building on our chain. Assuming I can pass the torch to some uh, new programmers. Kind of interesting. Oh, I can give my uh, trust metric. What the heck? So I, I didn't actually know about um, this bounty system. Is that used in Agoric as well? Is it? No, um, it's not used in our chain anymore, right? Uh, not currently. Uh, well, it sort of is, Jim. I guess you do it informally. Um, where'd it go? Yeah, it's... Uh... We're following the same process, although not exactly. Uh, the bounty system used the three pirate rule. So this was my five minute uh, lightning talk on the bounty, on the trust metric bounty system. Uh, so we had this bounty system and it, it was, it was kind of a success disaster. There was one, it, it, uh, it resulted in this contributions from this guy named Abner Zhang that was really cool and a plugin and stuff like that and some translation of the architecture document and moderators for the various forums. And then there were some things that were not so great. People were came in and started sort of gaming the system. Um, so there's a thing called Gresham's law where bad money drives out good. If it's easier to tear down and build up, then the whole system comes down. And we know that building up by real contribution is not easy. So there was this website called Advocado in 1999. Um, and this guy, Raph Levine, who's really smart, came up with this trust metric with the goal of accepting as many valid accounts as possible while reducing the impact of attackers. And he had this math. And um, okay, so what, what, what would happen is you'd log in and people would certify each other. So I would say that this guy's a journeyer or a master or whatever the heck. Uh, and the result is I, the, out, of, out of that, so all, this was the inputs to the math and then blah, 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 blah. And then that, well, the output was I got, eventually got certified as master level, which was surprising me at the time. Uh, still is a little bit. Okay. So is, is that like um, your... Uh, proficiency at, at coding at programming right at level. yeah okay. whatever the that community thought was was good um which and it was a it was out it was, it was about open source software de development and contributions and stuff like that 
Okay, um, got you. So I think the interactive simulator still works. Let's see. Oh, nope, not today, Zerg. Um, but uh, was that was that from Buzz Lightyear? Sorry. Yes. Not today, <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking, what, what's that? It sounds familiar. <laughs> I remember playing um, a Buzz Lightyear game on, on PS2 when I was super young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, you, this, this interactive thing, you can sort of see it, it. It adds a new circle, and it's either a good guy or a bad guy with some uh, probability. And then the bad guys, like, endorse bad guys, and the good guys don't or something like that. I can't remember how the simulation works, but you can sort of watch it. And the bad guys always stay out at the edge. They don't, they don't. Um, uh, and so this is, this is sort of a, it's kind of a decentralized way to decide who's a spammer and who's not. It, it's not completely decentralized because there is a seed of the trust. You, you start the algorithm with like three accounts in the middle. So I guess that's kind of similar to the um, to like the blockchain model, right? Where you have all these different uh, miners or validators, and they kind of tell each other if so, if one's done something wrong. Is it kind of based on that? Um, I, I guess there's a similarity. This is sort of a consensus algorithm in a way. But we, what we did was we ran this as an application on top of the blockchain. That was the idea. Uh, okay. The blockchain is sort of a, a high integrity compute substrate. And so you can, you can make smart contracts that, ex that execute this algorithm and you can make the smart contracts like in charge of money. And then, um, you know, people that are blue get to get to spend money. And, and actually what we did in the our chain bounty system was um, somebody will do a task and they'll say, um, I think this is worth a hundred dollars or whatever. And then the blue, blue people with blue circles get to say, yeah, I agree. That's a hundred dollars. No, it's $50 or whatever. And then we kind of averaged and, um, the people with higher rankings got more weight than the average. Okay. Okay. I got you. And then we actually paid out the money as, as a, you know. It wasn't all, we didn't completely um, get it executing as smart contracts. We were using spreadsheets and stuff, PHP and stuff, but the goal was to get it all on the blockchain. Interesting. The and final the main, was problem was, main problem was it was too easy for people to give people they didn't know that well a high rating. I mean, you know, you know, Rick, you know, that was the way people made friends was they raided each other and they, and then you ended up with these, uh, these conspiracies that would emerge and things of, you know, raiding bad actors. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, in the current uh, system on our chain, Okay, no, really, uh, no mechanism is given for trust, but the, the challenge is that to make people accountable for the trust they give, so that uh, 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 they'll uh, uh, we won't have the uh, uh, the bad actors that we had in the uh, first prototype. <laughs> Yeah. We did. We did have slashing. Um, I think the the problem. I don't think that the whole system was really had a fair shake. I think the whole the the, the yeah well, the well just was poisoned. The well was poisoned before we got it really started. Right, and once we once we got it all figured out, we, all of a sudden the money was gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like we just got it working, <laughs> and you know, uh, we got, you know, we got, we did to get get the bad actors out there. We had, we had topic guides, who uh, would review uh, uh, proposals in their topic area, and uh, 
it was starting to work really well. Yeah, and then there was some really bad events in the middle of 2018, and and everything got conservative at that point, and the bounty system just got shut down. They're like, anything that might be bad goes away. Okay, yeah, no more of this playing around. Well, any, anything that's not core development went away. <laughs> it was, was supposed to yeah. go away. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, that hasn't happened as far as I can tell. Yeah, and... Uh, we have this issue now of converting to an LCA, and we have a large, a large cons uh, uh, constituent of members who are against it because uh, of the way that money is being spent. Yeah. Oh, they have four days to get the financial reports out. They're done due at the end of the quarter plus 20 days. Yeah, is anybody working on that? <laughs> you can ask if you're friendly board members. Yeah. You know, I have a meeting with Daryl today. With whom? Daryl. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. At this Monday, I have a meeting with uh, Steve Ross Talbert. Uh, see ya. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to be retired and they're sort of, uh, I guess I just talked to Rob. Say that again? I was saying I need to talk to Rao. I mean, oh, Rao, okay. I thought somebody else said that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, Rao got me into this fight to get changed to an LCA so they can take investment money. But um, uh, I, I'll go put the ball back in his court. Where, where, Where's the financial reports? Right. I can't do anything without those. <laughs> One of the novel things about our, the Archain uh, thing is it's a co-op. I guess that makes it difficult, doesn't it? Getting consensus with everyone. Uh, well, they don't try very often. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's more difficult. <laughs> yeah, there is a, anyway. In theory, at least, it's supposed to be cooperative governance. Um, right. And, and to some extent, I blame the members because they're not participating in the governance. That's the one job that I have on our chain is I'm a member of the governance committee. You recently said it has an open membership. That's not true. It's appointed by the board. Maybe maybe you open the meetings to all members, but the, that doesn't make that doesn't make the members of the committee. Well, I I, well, I said it has been open because anybody who's requested uh, to join uh, uh, has been uh, admitted by the consent of the mem existing members. But um, that's not how the the, the, the so, committee works according to its charter. Ian was very pointed about this. You know, when I joined one meeting, he said, "You're not even a member of this committee." <laughs> anyway, I, this, to me, it, I think it, it it comes from leadership. If the leadership, I mean, the leadership doesn't. The few times when the membership has participated in the governance, the leadership has ignored it. For example, the membership decided that these financial reports are due at 20 days after the quarter. So with that, you know, there's, that gives people very little motivation to participate in the, in the governance. That was, that was an IOB? What was that? Yes. Yeah. 2018 IOB. So... Yeah, I tried to participate in the governance. I tried to, you know, I, the whole special meeting thing. I got 10% of the meeting, 10% of the membership to, to uh, you know, in, endorse 
the idea of something. Uh, I got them 10% of the membership to say thank you to Barry and Mark and Kevin. Um, but the membership, the, the leadership wasn't hearing it, so. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly the board uh, essentially has uh, been given control by the membership, well, by the charter. But the, there are decisions that the members make that are supposed to bind on the board and the board right. has not carried them out. So. Yeah, well, uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, like you know, you've done a good job. It, you've been the only one, really, that has uh, you know been holding them to task at all. So, yeah, I mean, other people just sort of just complain, but yeah. So a lot of what I did at the web, cons I did some technical stuff at the at the, the web consortium, but, um, but a big part of what we did was web accessibility and the patent policy and this process document. Um, and this is sort of like, uh, I can tell you all the stories that, you know, where something went bad and something, so it was like, oh, we should make a rule about that. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of what I did was try to automate parts of it, um, like the technical report publication process. Um, we had this software that would check whether things were in order. And if not, it would go, nah, try again. Um, so, Again, that's something I see as smart contracts now is how you, you know you make you, you can automate certain parts of organizational processes. So my latest one is the request one build process. Uh, so people request one build and then there's some reviewers and this thing harvests the data out of discord and shows the status of their requests and shows which so and these are the blockchain transactions where the requests were fulfilled this one was a duplicate request and then this one's actually pending uh, cool so i haven't managed to put this into the archain sorry uh Gort, um smart contract framework, but that's one of my wishes. Where'd it go? Uh, yeah, I saw they have to, um, they have to agree that the process will take a few days to a week now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so really impatient people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the whole blockchain space the, the level of entitlement is really disturbing. <laughs> yeah. You know, people, people are like, when do I get this thing? Not, you know, are you going to give me this thing? Or, you know, is there any way that I could earn this thing by contributing? No. When do I get this thing? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, where is it? Where, where did I put it? Oh, well. Somewhere I made a wish about putting this into the, the Gork Smart Contract platform, but I haven't managed it yet. We did this governance proposal a while ago, or a couple, a week or so ago, to start one of our smart contracts. And we're going to start the whole test net over on Monday and then do a, a vote to start the run protocol contracts on Friday. That's the plan. Oh, cool. My and tech. you mentioned you ideally you'd like to have some of the build holders get involved. Yeah, that's where I was before you guys joined. Um, let's see. Uh, hold on. Clearly, I need more tabs. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was late, by the way. Were you late? 
We didn't really notice. <laughs> yeah. It's office hours. You come and go, and it's kind of a. <laughs> um, right. So we got to get the platform software on Monday, and then uh, this says install. Anyway, um, so I was telling you that ideally all you need is Kepler. Mm, yeah. So there's this page, wallet.agoric.app, mm. and that's not Kepler. This is Kepler. And Kepler allows you to choose different blockchains. Here, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to dynamically add blockchains. So I'm going to delete. No, I can't delete the one that I'm. I'm on, so I'll go back to Cosmos Hub, um, and I'll delete Agoric DevNet. Yes. Okay. Now I'll reload this page. I'm not sure if I had to do that, but it's anyway. Okay. So now install Wallet. Uh, normally you do Agoric Mainnet, although the Mainnet is now integrated. You don't even have to add it. Uh, but you can go to the DevNet and configure. And say, exper ooh, experimental feature, scary, scary. All right, approve. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. Uh, Goric Dev 8 is, so this will be Goric Dev 9 on Monday. Mm -hmm. Good Lord, we're in the crick don't rise. <laughs> um, so that's configured. I don't know why the dialogue oh. doesn't go away, but whatever. Uh, so now I can choose. Agoric DevNet. If you were in the mood, you could try doing that, Shafi. You should be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try that. I'm not at home right now, but right. Um, yeah, when I get in front of my PC, I'll get that. Um, and then the next thing I was going to try to do was um, let's uh, how do you, where's the governance thing of Kepler? How do you do governance in Kepler? Uh, I think if you click on Kepler on the extension, yeah, I'm in the extension. Click on stake, it will take you to like a web page. Right. So this is where things go yeah. bad. On uh, DevNet, we've got this. Oh, there's no government. Oh, wait, there's proposals. Yeah. Um, but so to see this red box up here, there's something's failing somewhere. So I, I need um, to get a, some help or whatever, figure out why that is. Um, because that you can't, you probably can't fix and you probably can't participate unless it's fixed. Uh, okay. So I need to find somebody from Kepler or somebody in our team because we set up this page and it could be that this page is, is not saying the right things about our DevNet. Okay. So. So if we have build on mainnet, it, it wouldn't appear in DevNet, would it? So we That's have to like request some build or something. Yeah, DevNet. we do have a faucet. Uh, okay, got you. Yeah. Right. Oops, sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, New York faucet. Where's the faucet? I think it's under dev, I guess. It's a bit right. lower, yeah. So you go faucet, delegate, blah, 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 and it'll give you some build. Ah, cool. OK, awesome. I should probably ring off and actually get to it. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks for showing me and talking me through all these cool things. Learned a lot. You're welcome. Do I have these duplicates? Okay, so what I often do is go uh, tab copy, 27 tabs today. This is a 
Big one. <laughs> and it turns to half turn. And sometimes we share the recording. Sometimes we keep it private. Um, oh, okay. If you wanted to get the recording, we we share it at least as far as this channel here, which is in collab. Let's see, how do I do this? Invite people, copy, and then if I go here, I do that. Okay, so that's the collab. And then the Smart Con Contracts OCAPS channel. Jim sort of runs the collab thing. I guess I'm an admin too, though. Yeah, there's a number of admins, but I trying to uh, trying to uh, or hoping that someday uh, people take some leadership responsibility there and. Uh, Right now, there's not much happening, but yeah. it's really for experimenting with cooperative behavior where there is no uh, leader, which is uh, sort of the uh, digital digital life collective uh, philosophy, which uh, digital life collective is kind of defunct, but uh, everyone should have the same power is sort of the opposite of uh, security. <laughs> it's a matter of, uh, I, I guess, uh, affirmative trust. Am I seeing the right thing here? What, what's your Zoom or your, your YouTube channel called? Um, uh, what, Collab, our chain. Uh, no, it's Divi Dow on here, isn't Divi it? Divi Dow. Thanks. I didn't know where my head is. I can't spell it. D I D V V Y. Yeah, we go. There it is. Yeah. Now some things we make listed and some things we make unlisted. Right. And we just we just put them in the uh, in the cola in the collab channel. Oh, got it. If I search Divida, I should find that as well. All right. Well, I'm gonna run along. But the you know the Discord and the and the YouTube and uh, our servers are. Uh, managed uh, collect cooperatively in principle. Right. Hmm. So what do you do, Sharif? Um, I work in finance. So I work as a finance business partner. Um, so basically just looking after the finances of a project uh, that the UK government runs. Um, uh, chartered accountant. Um, so yeah, it's not as exciting as the world you guys are in, um, but yeah, something. Well, when I went to the original web conference, I said I wanted to be able to do boring things like renew my driver's license over the web. So our goal is definitely to make it so that uh, the stuff is relevant to things that people consider less less exciting. Yeah, no, I think we could definitely do with blockchain in the accounting world for sure. It would, uh, yeah, make things a lot cleaner. <laughs> Here's hoping. <laughs> All right, take care. Yeah. yeah, you too, guys. Thanks again. Yeah. Good, good to see you. You too. Bye.